to this equation of photosynthesis. Plants use light for energy. They convert water and sugar, water and CO2 into sugar and oxygen. So it's this balanced equation. In that equation, <coughs> nutrients don't exist. Light for energy, CO2, water, sugar and oxygen. That's what plants do. Nowhere in this equation do nutrients exist. Nutrients are merely balancing the salt outside of the plant and inside the plant. You can't drink four gallons of ocean water, ocean water in a day. You can't drink four gallons of tap water in a day. Both of them are lethal because they upset the osmolarity of your blood, the water in your cells, and that's how that's what changes. It's the same thing for a plant. You put too many PPMs in hydro, you're going to end up with too many PPMs. The plant will burn. Same thing with soil. Um, in soil, that tends to build up because anywhere where the roots are not, nutrients collect because there's no roots there to absorb them. So there's this relationship where nutrient food is calories and the amount of exercise you do is light. Light builds flowers, nutrient is merely the food calories that support the exercise of light. So I tell you guys that a 400 watt light is equal to eight flowers every 60 days. A 600 watt light gets you 16 flowers. In terms of relative yield in the same time, a, 16, a 600 watt light gets you twice the yield and a 1000 watt light gets you 24 flowers. So in the math game, the 600 watt is the most productive light. It's 50% more electricity than a 400 watt, but it's twice as bright. You don't get the same jump from 600 watt to 1000. So different amounts of lights will get you different yields. If that wasn't true, why did you buy the light at all? If it was just about nutrients, why did you buy the light? Why did you buy the most expensive, hottest thing that you have to cool if you didn't need it? Otherwise, you just grow in the dark. And there are things that grow in the dark. Um, sure. Indoor gardening is not one of them, right? Hmm. And so the more light you have, the more yield you expect. So yield is based on light. Nobody tells you double your nutrients, double your yield. You double your nutrients, too much salt, you kill your crop. Double your light, however, double your space, double your yield. But you wouldn't double the nutrients. You'd use the same amount on both sides. Um, what I tell you guys is that nutrients, the correct amount is the correct amount. Anything more than that just wrecks the product, and anything less than that just wrecks the product. So if this was no nutrients, this is the correct amount of nutrients here. And then everything else beyond here is generally too many nutrients for the plant. It's not what you think. Nutrients are required, but not in the doses generally that people give them. That's why too much light, too much water, and too many nutrients are the top three problems. Plants aren't going to speed up. It's just your job to fully express the light. You run the plants at about 85% because if you put the plants too close to the light, you end up burning them and they can't go anywhere. So if you give a plant 101% light, it can't grow into that space, so it's over. If you give a plant 100% light, it can't go any further. She can't tolerate any more. So not only do hoods, so not only do hoods require a certain amount of distance to spread into their shape, they require a certain amount of distance for the plant so there's still room to grow. You can't put a plant up against 100% light. Where is it going to go? They don't grow in 100, they can't grow in too much light. Um, and then when we start to talk about the, what too much light actually means, because I've always got the customers that come in, uh, my light meter says something, something. Whatever light meters say, I don't know. But they always come in and they know it's some number. And that's almost irrelevant. Think about it in terms of light equals space. A 400 watt, two by four, two feet deep, 16 cubic feet. That's as much plant material. Don't care about how tall the plant is. You need about 16 cubic feet of leaf to get everything that you can get from a 400 watt light. You need a four by four space, two feet deep twice a 400 because 600 watts twice a 400 watt light and a 5x5 five five space two feet deep 50 cubic feet to fully express a thousand watt light but you can't grow an apple without growing a tree and you can't grow 24 flowers per thousand watt from one cutting so you have to have a certain amount of plant volume to convert the light plants double during flower so you have to have twice the amount of light in flower if you veg with a 400 watt light two by four two feet deep you flower with a 600 watt light Four by four, two feet deep. Plants double when they go from veg to flower. You have to double the light when you go from veg to flower. So a customer comes in my store. The first question I ask a customer, do you have a favorite question that you ask? No, I have one question. That is, how much light do you have in flower? 
If a customer tells me 1,000 watts, I automatically know they have to have 600 watts in bed, and they have to have a five by five space two feet deep, or you know, one big plant you know, this big around, or four plants this big around, or six plants this big around. The shorter the plant, the smaller the plant, the more you need to absorb the light. One very big plant is just as effective as 20 little ones. The reality is you need a certain amount of leaf to convert a certain amount of light into a certain amount of flower. That's the relevant game. So yield is based on light. Nutrient merely supports the amount of calories. Um, you can see this is the spread of the light. Um, the hoods have different shapes. Big hoods take the same light. They spread it wider with less penetration. Shallow hoods. Um, oh, no. Yes, big hood. The same amount of light in a big hood has less penetration but a greater width. And then you take a shallow hood and it has greater depth, less width. So when you look at this picture, hmm. so when you look at this picture here, you can see a focused hood on a wide canopy doesn't work because most of the light's in the middle. It'll go through the plants and hit the floor. Here at the edge, big plants, narrow hood, because you want more penetration because the plants are taller. But regardless, it's a certain amount of volume of leaf required to convert all of that light into sugar. Um, plants at least double when they go through flower. So you grow a plant for four weeks and you flower a plant for eight weeks. They're going to double during flower. Everybody says they don't grow, you know, they're not doing this, they're not doing that, but you've got eight weeks where they might triple. Some things will triple in size. So you, one, you have to plan for that, but that doubling in size is why you require twice the light in flower. So if you veg with the 400, you're going to need twice the light and flower. Because if you veg with the 400, and you grow 400 watts worth of plant, 16 cubic feet, four by two, two feet deep canopy. Um, if you flower with 400, you're still gonna get the same canopy. It will just be you know, two feet higher and you'll have more branch underneath. So you're trying to absorb all the light with the green of the leaf. Uh, if you continue and flower with the same amount of light, you get light, you get the same canopy, it just keeps moving up and the bottom keeps dying to sacrifice itself for the top. So there's kind of a relevance, how much light, how big of a space you have, how many plants you have. And in your bag, I put together this book, the grow book one, um, grow school book, looks like this. There's a couple of charts. If you start on page one, you'll see this is a troubleshooting guide. So generally I find that there's only five problems, too much light, too much water, too many nutrients, bugs, not enough mag. Those are the all five problems. There is no pH lockout. pH lockout is a description of overwatering and rotting the root hairs. If you can't absorb nutrients and you only absorb salt, I mean only absorb water and no nutrients, your plant puffs up. It looks like nutrient lockout. You'll have you know, a table of let's say like 12 plants that are in flower or something and you're, you know, you're growing them under a light. They'll all appear purple. They'll all have a mag problem. If you overwater the plant rotten root and rot the roots, the first thing that will show up is all your plants will purple because you can't absorb nutrients and the first thing that suffers is mag. The next thing that'll happen is all of your plants will appear to have a different micronutrient problem. This one will have a zinc hole in it. One of them will have a boron twist. Someone will come to my store looking for eyewash because it has boron or something in it to give to their plant. All the nutrients that we sell in hydroponic stores, they all have enough micro. It's not the micro, it's not pH lockout. You've rotted the root hairs and the plant can't absorb any salt, any nutrients, and it appears to be like pH lockout. But you tell me, I mean, I drove here from Las Vegas, right? There are plants the whole way through. Nobody takes care of the pH. Nobody looks, the rain <laughs> falls, the animals piss, the stuff goes through the <laughs> rotted vegetation on the ground, and pH isn't controlled by anything. Except the plant, the roots actually control the pH. She'll change the pH in her root zone to attract different nutrients. Um, the plant will control it, you don't have to worry about it. Generally, anywhere from five to seven is fine. I mean, there's everywhere you look that there's grass and that there's anything growing, no one's watching the pH. It sort of balances itself. Um, besides, you're in your garden so often, you're, you, you know, how would you ever get pH outside? You know, you're in there every day, you check on it all the time. Um, it would, you'd be hard pressed to get a pH outside of the five to seven range. You'd have to have a serious problem or the water would have to be evaporating. 
So generally, pH problems is never the, never the reason. It's never genetics. People, oh, they blame genetics on mold. They blame it on all sorts of stuff. There's really five problems, and they're kind of all covered here. So I say that it's too much light, too much water, too many nutrients, bugs, and mag. So the first problem, is it one leaf in this corner right here? Is it one leaf? If it's one leaf, it's bugs. Plants are systemic. And so if a plant has a nutrient problem, it's everywhere. It may start at the top or the bottom or the outside in, but it's definitely the whole plant. So, yes. What do you mean by one leaf? One leaf. That's a fact. Yellow spot on a leaf. Oh, gotcha. Yeah, you see okay. some gray on top of the leaf with some black dots, something there, one leaf. It might be on a second leaf, but it's not systemic around the plant. It's not all the top leaves, all the bottom leaves. Gotcha. It's not starting gotcha. in the middle on the way out. It's isolated events, okay. bugs cause problems on a leaf and then move on. Mm. And so you might not see the bug before you see their damage. So if it's one leaf, you've got bugs. Generally what you'll see is it's a yellow dot. That's the thing, it's a spider mite. You'll mm. see one dot on, right, yes. You'll mm. see one dot on one leaf and that, got, that leaf cell got bit like five days ago, six, seven, eight days ago. That one cell has died. It works well if you hold it up to the light and look through you'll be able to see the individual cells. If you got one cell that died, you know the spider mite has moved on and started to lay eggs. But that's the thing, one leaf, always a bug, can't be anything else. So if the answer is no, um, are your leaves clawed and puffy? Do they have speed bumps? Do they look like this, chicken clawed? The space between the veins, is it puffy? That's because you've rotted the root hairs or you've overwatered and then rotted the root hairs and you end up with too much water inside the plant. Not enough, not enough salt outside, too much water inside the plant, so it puffs up. Um, otherwise, are the leaves thin, drooping, and curled under? So this is clear light, way too much light, and that's typically one of the problems, and you'll see everybody puts their lights right on top of the plants, 18 inches over the plants. If you can't spread the light far enough to get over the crop, the closer you put them, it's tough to put a hood 18 inches, like for a thousand watt light, five by five, two feet deep. If you put a hood 18 inches over it, you wouldn't light up the outside foot and a half. So you have to have the light high enough to get the spread, to capture all of the light, to spread it out over enough leaf that it can get absorbed. So too much light. The classic two examples that I run into are four by four tent, thousand watt light. Oh man, I got a four by four tent, thousand watt light. I go, all right. So I told you my first question is how much light do you have in flower? My second question is, what's your average yield? Because if somebody tells me that they're getting 16 flowers per 1,000 watt, I know they're eight flowers short because they should be at like 24. So if they're at 16 flowers and they're coming up short, but they're finishing, you kind of know that they don't have enough plant material to absorb all the light. If they come up way short, half short or less, you know they have problems like bugs, something serious like that. Um, and so you can kind of get an idea based on someone's light and flower and how much yield they get where they're at. If you have a 400 watt light, and a thousand watt flower, and your plant doubles during flower, then by the end of flower, you end up with about 800 watts worth of plant. And you know what I mean by 800 watts worth of plant, like as much plant as you could grow under an 800 watt light before the bottom started suffering. So if you put a 400 watt veg with a thousand watt flower, you end up with about 800 watts worth of plant at the end of the flower cycle. But you've got a thousand watt light, which means like halfway through flower, you had like 600 watts worth of plants. So you're throwing 400 watts at the floor. You have to have enough plant to absorb all the light to convert it into sugar. And that's the name of this game. And nutrients support the effort. So in this question here, are your leaves thin, rolled, and curled under? In a four by four tent, two feet deep, you've got 32 cubic feet of plant material, but a thousand watt light requires 50 cubic feet. So you get like three quarters of the yield that you're supposed to. Think about it like a pizza. 16 and 18 inch pizza, those last two inches all the way around, like equal the 16 inch pizza inside. You know, there's a lot of material on the outside. You know, four by four, five by five doesn't sound like much until you get, you know, three quarters of what you're supposed to get time and time again. So I see, you know, I, I do this a lot and I explain this a lot to people and they go, oh, you know, that's not bad. And then I go, well, how long have you been growing? And they tell me years and I go, all right, so you're 33% off times five years. All hmm. of a sudden, that's it's a, a house. It's a huge production, you know what I mean? It's a big deal times all of that. So suddenly the math of it, then it gets even worse. 
Because if you've got a thousand watts in flour and you've got 400 watts in veg, there's an air conditioner on somewhere. And so you've got a thousand watts in AC. Now suddenly you've got a 600 watt production with a thousand watt light, a thousand watt AC and a 400 watt veg. So you're getting 600 watts results from like 2,400 watts of electricity. That's awful, awful, awful. And suddenly the numbers go down, down, down. So you've got 2,000 watts in flour, and let's say you're doing it right. You end up with 2,000 watts in flour, 1,000 watts in veg. You're at 3,000 watts plus an AC to cool it. Now you're at 4,000 watts. That's a lot of electricity for 2,000 watts in flour. I know nobody likes to think about the electricity that it costs to veg mm. or the electricity that it costs to cool the house because you have to turn your AC on or that you have to close the bathroom vent and all the other vents to get enough AC into that room. But the reality is that all that electricity is what's required to be put into the yield. So the condition of too much light, you put a thousand watt in a four by four tent. Let's say you did a good job. You got two feet worth of canopy you're off by 30%, you need 25%, you need 50 cubic feet to fully express that light. So you can either do three feet worth of canopy, because that'll get you 48 cubic feet, that works. But in the tent, you don't necessarily have enough room. Unless you look at one of those gorilla tents, those things are pretty clever, check out that gorilla tent. You can put an extension on it. So now you can get the light far enough away to make a spread. The problem that you run into is that, is that in a regular tent, if you put the hood here, it ends up here. How do you get, you know, you still have to grow enough plant plus a bucket plus what you trim to fit in here. Here's a two by four tray. Two by four, two feet deep, 400 watt light. Put a 600 watt light in this tent. You need to grow a three foot canopy to absorb it all. If you, if the lights count and your canopy ends count, that's too close to the spread. So Gorilla lets you add an extra foot and it traps all the light inside their tent and keeps it focused down. Brilliant idea for something like that, especially with different size hoods. Now you can put a small hood in there, keep the light focused and get a lot of penetration. But that four by four tent with a thousand watt light is the one common mistake. The next common mistake is a four by eight tent with 2000 watts in it. The same problem that you run into in a four by four with not enough space is the same problem, but twice as bad with even more heat, more ridiculous heat in a four by eight. So I try to give you, I try to get you guys to think if a 600 watts, four by four, two feet deep, you can put two 600 watt lights in there. That's pretty good. The alternative is a thousand watt light and one of these light movers that slide back and forth. A light mover is worth 25% more yield because you can put the light a foot closer because you take the hot spot off the plant and move it away. And so the plant has a chance to cool before it comes back, like a cloud between you and the sun. Ah, uh, <laughs> the Vegas sun, maybe not the Texas sun. The Texas is humid. So the light mover allows you to put your plant, a light, your light a foot closer to the plants so you get more penetration from the same hood. So a light mover is worth 25% more. Um, because light is part of the photosynthesis equation. Light for energy, water, CO2 equals sugar and oxygen. You can't water more, so you're really left with more light and more CO2. Those are the only two things in the photosynthesis that build more plant material. Nutrients merely support um, the calories of the amount of light that you give them. Twice the light, you'll need twice the nutrients. Half the light, you'll need half the nutrients. So all the bottles in this store are based on a happy, healthy, thousand watt garden. 1,000 watt garden with 1,000 watt plants toward the end. Um, Is that a okay. pretty typical uh, staple? It's usually measured at about 1,000 watts for yeah. measurements? Of yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Wash, rinse, repeat. They want you to use as much as possible. Right. Absolutely. Right. That is, you know, the, like multivitamins. I mean, they just want you yeah. to just consume that yeah. stuff. But the reality is you don't have to feed until the plant asks for it. Right. If the plant asks for it, you can continue to wait because when you feed her, she'll suck it up and use it and the problem will be resolved. If you water four ounces a day, oh, every day I'm in there with just a little bit, she stays too moist for too long and the roots rot. And so you water when she asks for it, you feed when she begs for it. Because if you feed her, the thing will grow back and it will be just fine. Mm -hmm. And you know you're not overfeeding because you can see. Um, all right, is the plant stunted with yellowing tips or leaves? This is classic too many nutrients. and you know, in all fairness, I get a lot of growers come through the store and go, look, I did the exact same thing I did last time. And she's dying from too many nutrients. 
And there are a lot of reasons why the same thing this time won't work. I'll give you one example. Um, in Vegas, it gets hot. Um, we have plants that grows outside. We got palm trees outside my store, 120 in the winter, 30 degrees, 130 in the winter, 120 in the summer. And they're beautiful. It's tap water. Nobody feeds them. Nobody deals with them. And they look great. I don't even think palm trees belong in Vegas. But they're outside my store and they look great. Nobody does anything to them. They're not being given too many nutrients. They're giving, being given a lot of water. And what happens is if you get a hot room and the plant sweats, they, uh, they transpire, right? They drop little drips of water out. And that's part of their metabolic process. That's how they get rid of their waste. O2 gas is part of their waste and they release water and sweat um, when they breathe. And that's part of their sugar process conversion. They, that's their bio waste of the chemical reaction. If it gets too hot in a room, they'll sweat more. If you don't lower the nutrients and they drink twice the water, they drink twice the nutrients. And suddenly you have a condition where with work yesterday is overwhelming today. And that's a big problem and you don't think about it. So on hot days, you have to kind of lower the PPM and that way they can drink more water without getting more nutrients. Um, if the room gets too humid, it's a problem because then the plant can't sweat it off. So the same amount of nutrients suddenly becomes too much because the plant can't sweat. You can take a fistful of leaves, put them in a plastic shopping bag, tie a knot in it, and an hour later, that bag will be dripping moisture and 20 degrees hotter than ambient because the plants continue to heat up to, to transpire, to get rid of their water. And that humidity, that's the relationship. People are always like, what's the perfect humidity? There is no perfect anything in here. High humidity gets rid of spider mites, but it brings mold. Low humidity <laughs> gets rid of mold, but it brings spider mites. Everything has a checks and balance. Bugs cannot attack healthy leaves. If they could, they'd eat the rainforest. They'd dissolve the whole planet, and they'd continue to breed until everything was gone. So there's always a checks and balance. Bugs generally come from the bottom up on a plant. That's why you strip them and keep them in a nice, clean shape, because they can only attack sick leaves. That's what silica does for the cell walls. They make them thick so the bugs can't attack them, so the water can't evaporate, so they can tolerate more heat. That's those drought and bug resistant things that you hear about when people talk about silica. So when you look through these things, you see you can end up with too many nutrients from several ways. And the last one, is there any purple cupping of the leaves? Is there any tacoing of the leaves? That is mag, 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 mag. In a healthy garden, purple petioles, purple stems, the leaves will cup. They'll taco and fold up. Mag is the central molecule in the chlorophyll ion. It gets used up in the process of converting light into sugar. Plants are autotrophs. They take their energy from light. We're chemotrophs. We have to eat food. It is, does not work the same way, and that's why more food or more nutrients doesn't get you what you're looking for. Um, it just gets you something that smells like gas and burns like a road flare when it's done. <laughs> Holding the leaf up to the light gives you enormous insights that you would not otherwise be able to get. Um, you can see individual cells drop. You can see color changes, patches, things that you couldn't see looking at. Holding it up to a light will give you some insight. And so it is CalMag. Mag, 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 mag. So you want mag all the way through, start to finish. But you don't need calcium all the way through. You need sulfur toward the end. Sulfur is a ripening agent, and that's why you end up with a, um, like molasses, because molasses has sulfur as a preservative in it. And so you end up with um, sugar and sulfur as a ripening agent for the plant. There's a lot more mag in the sweet products than there is mag in the cow mag. And this is pretty good. One of the things that Advanced Nutrients does very well is they put mag in everything. Um, I mean, the other thing that they do very well is their marketing, right? Because they're twice as expensive. Mm -hmm. But they have that <laughs> pH perfect line. And I speak to you know lots of people like this, and they like the pH perfect. And it works pretty good. Our bodies do it for ourselves. It balances that pH. And so Advanced Nutrients is a pretty good line for it. But what they do best more than anything, more than any other nutrient, is they have mag in everything. They call it two or three different things and put it in their schedule just because they know that in the healthy garden, the number one problem is converting light into sugar is you run out of mag first. So Advanced Nutrients does an excellent job of that. Everybody else handles it with a supplement. Um, Botanicare has um, CalMag, uh, GH has CaliMagic or CaliMag. Um, yes, so these are the kinds of, those are the kinds of problems 
those are the top those are the problems that generally everybody runs into and they can pretty much all be traced to that short of your light falling on your plants okay that one's not in here but generally you know it happens so I don't have to kind of work that out and people generally kind of don't admit that all right the next two pages these are a schedule I have a 20 week garden tracker what I like to show you guys about the garden tracker is top left Different weeks have different sized plants, so you can see what's going on. There's five days per week for you to take notes on. There really isn't too much to do, so mostly you just put hash marks through it. Oh, is my filter dying and I smell something? Am I taking cuttings, clone? Is there a problem? Am I switching to flower? If you had a problem, you might mark down the solution. There's a little place for you to make notes, PPM, stuff like that in there. Right, I know, I have to put my glasses on now too. All right, no, I, I'm with you. All right, so this is a sample of that 20 week journal. If you flip through a couple of pages, you'll end up with the perfect PPM calculator. That's a big deal that I get. How many PPM do I need and when? So there's a couple of things that I try to show you. One is, it's relative. As the plant gets bigger, you're gonna give it more PPM. That doesn't mean you have to give it the PPM every time. And what I like to illustrate that point is, if you guys are transitioning from veg to flower, you're gonna go from a one gallon bucket to a five gallon bucket, let's say. If you feed that next round at 1,000 PPM, there's only one gallon of roots. So four gallons of media have 1,000 PPM in it the next time you water. So you water and you redistribute that PPM. Um, actually, in your bag, you guys have this set of cards. You're looking for the HM Digital one that has the mixing nutrients on the back. There's four bottles of nutrients. It has two meters on the front. Four, there you go, left hand top. Yes, that one. Looks like this. All right, so this thing here, yeah, that one. What I try to get with you guys, and if you look at the bottom left and the bottom right, what I try to get you guys to realize is you can see that there's roots in the bottom left picture. You can see in the bottom right, there's just all nutrients piled up in there. Mm -hmm because it's very easy to continue to give the plant too many nutrients, too many nutrients, too many nutrients. You're not aware that it's building up. Here's a way to kind of predict how many PPM you want, how many PPM the plants want. As they get bigger, they want more. If there's more light, they want more. So this is, what I, this is a blank one down here so you guys can write your own PPM in. But uh, what I want you to get before I show you the math behind it is, see how they get bigger? This one wants more light and more PPM than back here. If you try to give a plant this size, this much light, you need like 40 of them because otherwise you've got not enough plant, way too much light. So what I try to go over is this. We start here. This is the perfect PPM calculator. It starts with light because light is going to be the determining factor of what our yield is. We get eight flowers from a 400, 16 from a six, and 24 flowers from a thousand watt light. It also requires more space. So you have to have healthy plants and lots of into sugar. So the first question, what's your bulb? Let's say you got a thousand watt bulb. Second, light mover or CO2? Each one of those things is worth 25% more. Remember in the photosynthesis equation, light for energy, CO2 and water equals sugar and oxygen. So. CO2 and more light are the only two things we can add more of to get more yield. A light mover gives you more light and products like exhale CO2 give you more CO2. So here's a mushroom substrate with an inoculate on it. You break it up so the whole inoculate gets the substrate to cover it. Over the next few days to a week, this bag will puff up with CO2. And like coffee, it just off gases to all the CO2 is consumed. But in all conditions, CO2 is the limiting equation in photosynthesis, because you're not gonna add more water. And if you add more light without adding more plant, then you get into trouble because you have too much light and you burn the plants. So the only thing left to do is up CO2. You can add more light by adding a light rail, and moving the light over a distance, you can put the light closer, but the only thing left in the photosynthesis equation, CO2. CO2. So the question, the relevancy of how much light do you have a light mover and CO2? Because if you've got a thousand watt bulb and you're adding CO2 and you've got your light on a light mover, 
you've effectively got 1500 watts. 1500 watts, you are not going to get that yield in a five by five space two feet deep. That's a thousand watts. So if you come in and you tell me you've got a light mover in CO2, 1000 watt in a four by eight tent with a light mover, four by eight is 32, four times eight, 32, two feet deep, 64 cubic feet, um, I say that the thousand watts literally like 50 cubic feet plus 25% for a light mover and you're at like 62 equivalent space from a light mover and from a 4 by 8 tent. So like supreme performance in a 4 by 8 tent is a thousand watt light, half the heat on a light rail, seven watts, no heat. And so suddenly you can cover an entire 4 by 8 tent and get 25% more than just that thousand watt but you also have 25% more space. Yeah. So adding CO2 at that point and a light rail, suddenly your 1,000 watt light performs like a 1,500 watt light. That's why growers don't vent. They don't vent their lights. They don't suck the air out of the room. What they do is they buy an air conditioner and they cool it so they can add CO2. Because if you've got 6,000 watts on in a room, 25% is like another 1,500 watts for no electricity, you can, some heat, you might have to get a burner, that would up the AC, but you can literally buy a $2,500 AC, a one ton unit on rollers here at the store for probably 2,500 bucks and that will cool six lights and a burner. There are a couple of different ACs, there are cute little ACs that they sell for $500 of plastic rolls, the rollaways, <laughs> and then there's the real units. The big units, they cool four times the air, twice as much for the same electricity, a one ton unit that I sell in my store, 980 watts. That plastic roller unit, 1100 watts. And it does a third, a quarter of the work. AC is one of the few things in growing that scales up. You get 12 lights, requires one person to tend it. You get 24 lights, requires two people to tend it. It does not scale up well. But you go from a three to a five ton air conditioner, that's much cheaper than dealing with venting and all the glass in the hoods, like the glass is the second hottest thing in the hood. So I, in, the, in the garden, the glass is the second, right? the bulbs the first, the glass is the second. That's why your car is 140 when it's only 100 degrees outside, because the glass converts light into energy, into heat. So how much light you have, that's gonna be the basis for this equation of figuring out how many PPM. So a customer comes in the store and asks how many PPM, you got a couple of questions to ask. If you go someplace and someone just gives you an answer, you got to wonder, you know, I mean, you can't start in third gear, you can't go from first to fifth, you have to match the water and the light to the plant size. All right, the next question, how healthy are your plants? Do you have bug problems, leaf problems, light problems? Did you have too much light? Did you rot the roots? Every one of these problems is going to subtract from your yield, your life cycle. The next question is two parts. What week are you in and what's the expected crop cycle? So if you have a four week veg and an eight week flower, that's 12. If you're in hydro, you would subtract two because uh, hydro finishes shorter than soil. So you would have a 10 week life cycle and let's say you're in week five for the moment and then we'll continue on. The last question is how full is your garden? Because you have to have enough plant material to express the light that you're giving them. Too much light? and too small a space and not enough plant and you won't get the yield that you're expecting because you can't grow an apple without growing the tree first. So these are the questions that you kind of have to ask to figure out what the PPM is. But then in the top formula on the, formula on the other side, it's a pretty simple equation to get there. If you know that your life cycle is 10 weeks, if you know your life cycle is 10 weeks and you know, let's say you have a thousand watts, a thousand divided by 10 is a hundred. So you can figure about a hundred watts a week more and about a hundred PPM a week more. So week five, five times a hundred, you'd be at about 500 PPM. That way you hit the max at week 10. And then as you start finishing, you cut the numbers down. That's what this chart here tries to express to you. This one here, if you were at week five, you'd be at 500 PPM. If you're at week 10, 10 times 100 is 1,000. So as a basis, and sort of like a mathematical trick, the watts of light that you have are the max determinant of the PPM that's possible. Effective watts, not just the light. 
because if you have CO2 and a light mover, you're at 1500, you won't exceed 1500 ppm according to the chart. Now, after you've done 1500 ppm and you've marked your notes and you've worked out if it works, you can experiment. But you're not going to go wrong for too many nutrients. Now, I'm not suggesting that you have to use that ppm every time. Again, if you watered with a thousand and you just transplanted and you have one gallon of roots in a five gallon bucket, you've got four gallons of soil that are holding the nutrients. So you've got four gallons of soil at a thousand ppm. The next time you water, it'll redisplace the nutrients and you'll have five gallons of soil at 800 ppm. And the, the, where the roots are will consume those nutrients. And the next time you water, the nutrients get distributed and you'll have five gallons at 500 ppm. So when you look at the bottom of this card, what I try to express to you on one side and the other is you might feed the plant once with a thousand and you might not feed again for three times. You might feed water, 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 feed. And so you end up using all the nutrients. The problem is, is if your plant wants 500 ppm and you feed the bucket a thousand every time, there's 500 left over in the rest of the four gallons every time. And in the same amount of space, if you fed, 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 instead of feed, water, water, feed, you've got twice the amount of nutrients and suddenly the plant is miniaturizing, shrinking, the tips are burning. And then if the room gets hot, she's taking up even more nutrients and rapidly you create, an, right, an over nutrient situation. And so the relationship between how hot the room is, how cool the room is, the media, the water might be cold, she can't absorb the water, and so suddenly you, you know, she's not consuming the nutrients because of a temperature. So little changes, little subtle changes like that, they can't put on the bottle. So you kind of have to fly the plant and consider some of those things. I mean, second gear is awesome, but you wouldn't be at the fast lane in second gear. Great for across the street, great for getting up the ramp, but you have to be in the right size plant with the right size nutrient and the right size light at the same time because you're not gonna be able to get a thousand watt yield from a cutting. No matter how close you put the light, you're never gonna get the thousand watt yield from a cutting. So it requires a certain amount of space. So that's the correct amount of nutrients. And then we talk about mixing nutrients. So now you know how many ppm, but you don't know if it should be from nutrients or supplements, there are additives, there's all sorts of stuff. So the next question is supplements. Supplements are based on plant health. If, you have, if you're feeding with 500 ppm and your plants are 50% healthy because you had a light and a root problem or something like that, you would cut your nutrients by half and you would add things that solve the problem. Because if you left the nutrients where they were and you just dump more stuff on top of it, fixing a problem that you caused by giving it too much shit is not going to be solved by giving it more shit. So you have to slow the grow, slow everything down, raise the lights, lower the ppm, substitute it with what solves the problem. If it's magnesium, add magnesium. But she doesn't need NPK when the lights are raised and she's short on mag. It's the wrong thing at the wrong time. So you've got to get the right thing at the right time or you can't get from here to there. So the amount of supplements you have will be based on the amount of nutrients that you have. If your plant's 100% healthy, everything will come from NPK. If your plant's 75% healthy, you'll add whatever you require, strength the nutrients and substitute something else in. So I always try to tell you guys that mixing nutrients is a snap. Supplements first, because supplements solve problems. Then you add nutrients when everything's going well because you don't feed a sick plant. And you definitely don't give additives to a sick plant because that just make it sicker faster. <laughs> so supplements solve problems, add nutrients when everything's going well, additives next, and then, you know, the last picture, pH. You don't pH first, you don't pH during in between stuff, you just pH once at the end. Make sure it's anywhere from five to seven because the difference between 6.1 and 6.2 is nothing. You're not gonna get more yield, you're not gonna get less yield. There's anywhere from five to seven. If you want more yield, add more light. You're not gonna get it from the nutrients, you're not gonna get it from the pH. I mean, everything goes on outside without our help. So this is what I try to get to go over with you guys. Um, foliar spray, that's a percentage, that's a percentage of supplements. So if your plant has a mag problem, you'll water with mag, and you might back it up with a foliar spray for the plant. They can absorb it. But there really aren't a lot of reasons to foliar spray. There are some chemical tricks that you can do, but there's not a lot of reasons to foliar spray. Um, yield. Yield is based on light times plant health times garden size. Because if you have a half full garden of sick, shitty plants, 
It is not going to turn out the way you dreamed when you came in here, spent that money and thought you were going to take over the world. So you have to grow a healthy plant for this to work. Otherwise, the equation doesn't work. So if you have a half full garden of six shitty plants, you have, right, so you've got a thousand watt light times 50% times 50%. That's a whole lot of money for nothing. So yield is based on how much light you have times how healthy your plants were, their rate of photosynthesis, times um, how much plant material you had, because if you had <laughs> half a garden, even if it looked great, you can only produce half a yield, because yield is based on light times space times healthy garden. So you have to have all of those in there. There's a finishing and a cutting PPM as well. Cuttings don't require much. Um, you know, I made a couple of videos where we sampled a different products, and the thing that we found worked best for just this one thing, oh, they're gone. We should throw like a party here, like we're babysitting. Everything's <laughs> gone. This cut, this Clonex solution, we literally set up 16 trays. We videotaped the whole thing. If you give a plant, and and you know they come in my store and they tell me 25%, 25%, 25%. We compared this and that. Okay, I compared a couple things. We started 50 basil seeds in a root riot tray. We gave one tray nothing to see what would happen, and they died. By the end of the month, they died. We gave one tray this stuff and nothing else, and it was literally like five times the size and volume, but we gave the other one nothing. But then compared to the other 14 trays that we did, nothing was as good as this particular product. Now, we only did one product. What we found that there were four things that really worked best, and that was Clonex Solution with B1 and Thiamine. Um, Super Thrive, that yellow stuff, that mm. stinky yellow stuff. But a drop, I mean like we literally put a drop when we watered it, it wasn't, more wasn't better, it's a hormone. Could you imagine twice the adrenaline? It wouldn't make you run faster than that. So, um, yeah. So twice the adrenaline, that doesn't solve the problem. Um, the next one is enzymes. There's a couple different products on the markets that are zymes. Those were pretty good too. And microbes, microbes live on the roots. They scuff the roots, they protect the roots, the roots grow faster, they encourage root hair growth. There's no nutrients in microbes. So those are the things that we found work best independently, and they work even better when combined because there's no overlap. Hormones aren't enzymes. You know, they come from different things. They, come, they have different purposes. Neither one of them is B1 or thiamine. So neither one of them is microbes. So in conjunction, those are the things that really work together as a benefit but then only if your plants are healthy, because if your plants are sick, it really doesn't, you doesn't run them into the ground faster. Um, so now you can kind of see when we look at this, if you tried to put this much light over that plant, suddenly your thousand watt light in a four by four space doesn't make sense anymore. Now that you have a relationship that there's a certain amount of space required for a certain amount of yield. So that's what that book kind of goes over is a couple of different ways to predict that. Um, that's this part here in the centerfold. This is the plant charts that you guys could fill in. And then there's one more chart here on the back. And this one here is just kind of like plant size time prediction. So if you look at the left side, it says media hydro aeroponics. If you look across the bottom, it says quantity of plants. Across the top in green, it says days and veg. Then it shows you three different kinds of plants. There's a sog, where you grow very small plants. There's a scrog, a screen of green, where they're bigger and wider. And then there's 30 inch plants, the kind of their own big plant. Those are the three ways to grow it. If you notice, the bigger you grow them, the longer it takes. And the bigger you grow them, the fewer you need. All you're trying to do is fill up enough space to get enough canopy to absorb all the light. So the bigger the plant, the fewer you need. So there's something important to be said about plant count here. Not everybody wants more plants. Somebody comes in and they've got a yield, and they come in and they go, oh man, I got four flowers, four flowers per plant. How many plants <laughs> did you have? And how much light did you have? Because if you've got one plant with four flowers and you had a thousand watt light, it's miserable. But if you were growing under your bed with a compact fluorescent from your bathroom, it's awesome. So you have to find out how much light they had times how many plants they had. But yield isn't based on plant count, yield's based on light and how much light you can convert into sugar. So if you're res plant count restricted, you grow very big plants. And one of the other nice tricks to add to very big plants is LED. 
LEDs are one of those tricks because Okay, so LEDs like this next light here. LEDs have a little bit of magic about them. Not everything works everywhere. But then that can be said about anything. Everything in the store works. Somebody hates everything in the store because they think it failed them. But the reality <laughs> is, growers can grow with everything in the store. It's, you just make it fit for that particular garden. LEDs have something interesting because they have a huge amount of penetration compared to HPS lights. When you flower with an HPS light, most people strip the insides, bring the flowers up. Here with an LED, they grow a much denser plant. They penetrate the plant in a different way. Combine the two and you don't have to strip the inside anymore and now your plant has flowers on the outside and the inside. If you had a thousand watt light, you might put 200 watt LEDs on the side. If you added a thousand watts, that would be too much because then you don't have enough plant material for 2000 watts. But 200 watts of deep penetrating light, spectacular. And there really is a spectrum difference. You look at next light. Next light's the only LED that combines all the spectrum of an LED with an HPS light. It's pretty intense, it's pretty bright. It's a 550 watt light that requires a thousand watt space. It produces like a thousand. So you either have to kind of pull it high to get that spread, or you kind of have to put on a light rail and move it back and forth. Because that's what I show you here. LEDs, very direct. So they have more penetration than an HPS. If you put them on a scrog, you have to move them back and forth because you can't grow a thousand watt yield in a corner of a tent. So you have to spread the light. But together, LEDs and HPSs don't change your plant count and considerably increase your yield, um, same time frame as a supplemental light. LEDs also work great by themselves. They don't veg as well because they're really intense, but they flower great. I sold the guy nine tenths, comes in my store, wants nine tenths. He wants eight two by two tenths and one five by five tenths. Eight two by two tenths. I go, dude, what are you doing with eight two by two tenths? Guy buys eight 200 watt LEDs. He wanted a different flavor every week. A 600 watt five by five tent was his veg. And every week he finishes a different product. And he's, there was no production level math here. It was a simple equation. I want what I want. So not everybody, when they, what's the perfect way? Not everybody has a perfect way. We all try to accomplish different goals. Some people have greenhouses. You get everything started through the summer when it's too hot or when the winter it's too cold and then you have it to go outside when it's ready. That's one way to do it. That's an outdoor grow. Another way is vegging and flower inside, you know. But the same thing kind of applies. You only get a certain amount of plant material from a certain amount of plant. And you only get a certain amount of yield from a certain amount of light. And you have to combine them. Otherwise, you end up with too much light and too small a space. All right, so this chart here, it continues on to tell you how many days it should take to accomplish these individual sizes. Days in flower. It's not that aeroponics or hydroponics yields more than soil. It's that they do it in a shorter time. So if you get an extra harvest or an extra two harvests a year, the overall average goes up. But they are more technical. There is a greater risk of failure. What happens in a, if you have media, if you have a problem in media, it will take you 10 days to kind of see it and to start to resolve it. If you have a problem in aeroponics <laughs> in three days, right, yeah, you know, because you've tried this before, in three days, your plants are gonna be dead and you don't have any ability to recover because everything <coughs> happens so fast in aeroponics. So these are the different ways to think about light, space, yield, the problems that you have, how many PPMs you should be, where and when. And that's kind of, notice I haven't told you how to grow. Don't care if it's soil, hydro, or media, or soil, hydro, or aeroponics, you can grow in them all, I can grow in them all. The reality is, when we do indoor gardening, it's not what you think. And as things move to production level, and people start making production money out of it, you'll have to see things a little differently. You, I mean, a lot of what comes through my door at my store is uh, huge excitement. They're ready to do this right now. They're right, right? I mean, they're gonna take over the world by this week. Boom, light goes right on top of a thousand watt light, top of one little cut. Jack, yeah. yeah, but that's where, that's where that comes from because this isn't that game. You can't run things at 
we're shooting for 85%. If you get 85% of what you're supposed to, you're in the zone. You are in the money. LED is another trick to get more yield out of the same. Hey, no help, no help. In my store, he usually gives a bark or two, and then that's about it. So you take the spread. You have to be careful where you put your light and the shape of the zone. Mag's the number one problem in a healthy garden. Uh, light mover. Light mover gets you more. You won't know how much light, how much plant you can grow until the light falls off and the plant starts to suffer. Then you know you've run out of light. When you run out of light, that's when you know. But if everything looks great, if you could have put two more plants and raised the light without changing yield or increasing yield, you don't know those numbers. It's a, it's a little bit of statistics. Um, yeah, like I really, I haven't told you how to grow. I've just given you the idea. I've just kind of suggested at what the things you might want to avoid that have the highest probability of failure in this. Um, what comes through my store, I always get one of those guys who's testing stuff for a manufacturer. <coughs> I go, dude, what was your last yield? Oh, it didn't work, don't worry about that. <laughs> and I go, no, dude, you can't keep coming in here and telling me you're testing stuff for different manufacturers when you never finish. What are, what are you gonna do? Oh, you know, how are you gonna make a video of how spectacular their, infer, you know, their product was? And so I, I get a lot of guys who talk a lot of stuff, but the reality is some strains may work better with some nutrients and some nutrients may work better than others, but you're not going to get 25% more, even under the best conditions. Light mover, 25% more. Exhale CO2, CO2 is 25% more. Even if you use the nutrients perfectly to their maximum, what's it worth? 2%, 3%? What's the risk of giving too much nutrients? That's sure. why I try to keep you guys, it's 100%. Use too much, kill the plant. Put too much light, kill the plant. So all I try to get you guys to do is slow the roll, Expect a little less at a little slower rate. Understand that there's nothing you're going to read at 2 o'clock in the morning or invent at 3 o'clock in the morning that's going to blow your shit up, double your yield, or change or improve upon Mother Nature. That's the reality of this game. These are cloth pots. It's a good trick. When roots get to the bottom, they circle. That's why when you flip over your solo cup, you'll see a whole bunch of roots here, but the soil will all crumble out from underneath because in a cloth pot, it kills the root tip. When the root tip dies, the root hairs become roots of their own and branch out to the side and they grow root hairs of their own. The more root tips you destroy and the more new roots that grow with root hairs, the more nutrients you can absorb. So cloth pots, they do a great job. They are, they are a neat trick. Um, so, are, so are things like turbo cloners. <clears throat> you got a cutting and if you look at your Mondi cart, this is the orange cart orange Mondi card. This one has the tips and tricks for cuttings. So you've got this Mondi has a hygrometer that goes inside their dome. This is what you put your cuttings in to start them and there's a couple of different ways to start cuttings. You can do something like the dome. You know you start them in Root Riot starter plug, something like this. You put them underneath the Mondi dome like you see in this picture and then they start to root. The thing about roots is, they talk about the 45 degree slice, the thing about roots is they say, oh, there's more surface area for the roots to come out of. Sure, the 45 degree slice is the hypotenuse, and the hypotenuse is longer than the two legs of the right triangle, and so it works. But if you were to leave your plants there or bottom the roots, the side branches would come out and create even more roots, which is worth far more than anything else. So leaving them in this for another two weeks until they grow more roots up the stalk is a good idea. So it takes a couple weeks to root. Then you pinch the bottom root off and it's kinds of bushes out and you get a lot more roots. Hydro cloners like turbo cloner do the same thing. That's what this is. Um, you get this in the turbo cloner. You get these neoprene inserts that you put your cutting in. The cutting sticks out through the bottom. You can see like similar pictures here where you put the cutting in, the cutting sticks out through the bottom. The thing about hydro cloners like turbo cloners is you get roots two, inch, two inches up the stalk and literally all the way around. That's the benefit of doing something in a turbo cloner and you get them considerably quicker. This works. If you have a healthy donor plant, 
they will root into your hand. You don't need to do much. Everything that we do, like the Clonex gel pack that's inside the Root Riot, that speeds up the process. It converts the stalks, the stem cells, into root buds faster. Then once the roots start, stuff like plant success, the microbes, increase the rate of root growth. And so you can see that there's a couple of tips and tricks on this card for starting cuttings. The humidity, the Mondi Dome, the you know, cuttings should fit squarely in their starter plug. If they stick out the bottom or they rattle around in there, they don't root right. And so you really just got a nice little fit. If the stem breaks, get a new cutting to replace it. Don't try to save a broken stem. Um, and you know, here's a couple of you know, tips and tricks like don't take cuttings from strangers. You know? <laughs> Uh, anytime you take a cutting from friends, you should expect spider mites. You oh, should guaranteed. literally, indeed, you should quarantine it, pull off all the leaves, spray it three times over a couple of weeks, and then if she survives, maybe. But only then, you know, only then and maybe. So things like hydro cloners are good tips, or they speed things up. But if you've got a six shitty donor plant, or you've yeah. got a plant that's too soft with too much nitrogen, yeah. and the growth tips are folding over and falling, you're going to end up with the same results here because this happens even faster than media. Oh, rotations. Here's a, here's like you could pretty much build your business plan off rotations. Everything bigger than this is just a spin off of these three rotations. We have a cycle. Things start and stop at certain times. If you have one light, you're going to grow under it, let's say four weeks. You'll take the grow light out, you'll put the flower light in, and you'll flower under it. So you'll get a harvest eight weeks from then. So you got to harvest about every 90 days with one light. And then when you're done harvesting, you don't have anything to put under the light because you don't have anything growing. Oh, you don't have anything growing. Two light rotation. Now you have a veg and a flower. 400 watt veg, 600 watt flower, 1000 watt veg, 2000 watt flower. Yeah. And so here you start to see the relationship when you harvest your girls, you walk back over to veg, pull your plants out from veg, and move them into flower and have more plants in veg. People ask about rejuvenation. Should you put the plant back in veg? Well, there's really no need. If you cut it out and take it out of flower and you have a veg garden, then yes, you just cut them down and take them out of veg. If you have one light, you may want to rejuvenate it again. It doesn't save anything in terms of time. You could start from a little plant again and grow them up. Um, but here you're looking at rejuvenation as a possible solution for starting over. Not so much here because here, as soon as you chop your girls down, you have something to replace them with. All right, two light flower. Now instead of a harvest every 60 days, you got a harvest every 30 days. Veg, you start one garden in January, you start the next one in February, March finishes, you start it again, April goes next, chop them down, put more plants from veg in there, May, June, July, and now you get a harvest, it still takes 60 days, but you're not dealing with more product at the same time. So you can stagger your results. It does not matter if both lights are on at the same time. Just so all the plants are of a size under that light. You don't want plants with different size heights because you have to put your light, you know, several feet above the tallest one in the field. So to maximize penetration and light absorption, all the plants should be the same size, of a kind, of a shape, under a light. All right, veg. Have you ever grown 24 hours of light? You have the slowest transition time ever. Plants do things in their sleep. The sugars that they make during their day, they transport down to their roots at night. And you know this because if you overwater, you get what's called media stem rot, where the stem meets the media. It stays too wet here. The tubes that transport stuff from the leaves down to the roots, and then there's a tube up the middle that transports stuff up to the leaves. The leaves drop a little bit of water. It takes a new drop up at the root. The leaves drop a little bit of water and the water moves up the plant through capillary action. That's why she drops water and transpires. So here, there's a couple of different light choices. 24 hours, cuttings, little cuttings with no roots, little cuttings with some roots. They want 24 hours of very low T5 light. All you're trying to do is keep them alive until they root because they don't have any roots to take care of themselves. 18 hours of light and veg, because during the six hours of dark, plants transport the sugar they make during the day into the roots at night. Now, if you've overwatered and you've rotted the, where the media meets the stem, the stem 
will get like your fingers after they've been in the jacuzzi too long. Hmm. The stem rots hmm. and it hardens and it calcifies and it creates little knots right there. And it stops the leaves from sending sugar down to the roots. What happens is all your roots die back into an elephant foot. And this is when you're all done flowering or you've just given up because it's 10 weeks and you have no flowers yet, you pull it out and there's just a little bit of roots coming off one side of the bottom of the plant instead of all the way around filling up the bucket. That's because you get elephant foot. And the, the thing that you always find it is when you walk into the room and all the plants have just dropped. It, the media is wet, so it hasn't dehydrated. It's not like you can rehydrate them. The problem is when you wonder why, you pull it out, the bucket doesn't come out. You've got a big plant with the sparsest of roots. Um, at the end of a good grow, got a five gallon bucket, got a six foot plant, it's, it's stuff. Like you pull it out, you got a bucket full of roots. But where did the five gallons of media go? Where did the five gallons of cocoa go? Where did the five gallons of the substrate go? The plant consumes them. It consumes the media as she goes. Otherwise, you can't have a five gallon bucket with five gallons of roots and five gallons of media. You can't put 10 gallons in a five gallon bucket. So she consumes the media that's in the bucket and she displaces it with her roots. When you have a bucket and you finish and your plant didn't go anywhere and you're pissed off and you go to pull it out and it just, whoa, it just comes right out, but all your friends get buckets full of roots. That's specifically elephant foot. And the final thing that happens is you get sudden wilt. The room will be 74 degrees. The bucket will have water. There won't be any problems. And you'll come back and the whole plant has dropped. You can't add more water because there's water in the bucket. That sudden wilt is called elephant foot, and it comes from the media stem interface being too wet. Something similar happens if you try to veg for 24 hours. She builds her roots at night. She stores sugar as starch for long-term storage, so next year she can send up a shoot and start the process again. So here, if you veg with 24 hours of light, when she transitions into flower, she spends her time building roots instead of starting the transition. So your transition is delayed, and then the flower cycle is delayed, and she still might finish at the right same time, or she might not finish till two or three weeks later, but all of a sudden your schedule is extended by several weeks because she had to spend that time making up the root structure that you didn't allow her by letting her veg for 26, 24 hours a day. And so flowering is 12 on, 12 off, and veg is 18 on, 18 off. And so, do you guys know the difference between a veg light and a flower light? I mean, there's sure. obvious difference. One is metal halide and one's HPS. Frequency it, of the light, I can't remember what yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's blue and orange. And here's how it works. In the summertime, in the morning, there's two hours of orange and there's two hours of orange at night. On a 12-hour day, you get eight hours of blue in the middle. In the wintertime, when the sun is low on the horizon, you get three hours of orange in the morning and three hours or four hours of orange on either end. So you get a shorter day, you go from you know 12 hour days to 10 hour days, let's say. You got three hours on each end of orange light, and now you only have space for four hours of blue in the middle. It's, you literally go from like four hours of orange to six or eight hours of more orange light, and a little less blue. That's what people say that you add blue to orange light and you, you know, blah, blah. But again, double the light, double your yield. But the thing to consider is a blue light's like 20 degrees cooler than a thousand watt HPS light. You don't get the quite the same thing, but it's pretty friggin' close if you do a good job. It's a noticeable difference, but only on the high end. You have to be good to notice the difference. If it's your first grow, second grow, third grow, you're working out the details. You've never seen this before. <laughs> Buy a used bulb. Ooh. What do you know? You know what I mean? Like, there's lots of cars that aren't race cars, that aren't the fine-tuned cars, and we drive them every day. I'm just, there. I'm just they, suggesting they exactly. that. Hmm? The, they get you there just as well. Yeah. yeah. You can buy more light, you can spend more on light, but the reality is most people don't finish the first time. Bah! Something goes wrong, you put the light too close. It swung down, it dropped, the ducting blew out. It could be any of these things. Lots of reasons to kill your garden. Um, and so, you know, you kind of move through it, and then as you get better, you start to notice things, right? They say it takes seven years in your field to be a professional. <laughs> so there's still a lot to be learned. <laughs> and that's why, like, nutrients. On your first grow, if you're lucky, if you finish it. So who cares which nutrients you buy, but when you're good, and the plants do the same thing, 
and then you change nutrients, yes, absolutely, you can see a considerable difference. So all these people come to my store and they tell me, blah, 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 25%, 40%, scientific testing, blah, 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 blah. If everybody was successful at this, prices would plummet, supply would outweigh demand, and it would be an awful situation. So half the people have to fail. Otherwise, I wouldn't have any used equipment to buy for my store. <laughs> so all these people have to fail. There's a lot of people that have to fail at this. Um, and that's kind of the way I try to push you guys is if you can avoid failure, you stand a pretty good chance of success. That's kind of where I go with this. These are all simple things. I don't have the best way. That Everything works. Everything in the store works. Somebody hates everything in the store. Somebody wants eight tenths, nine tenths, because they want a different flavor every week. I had one guy walk in my store. He said, I want everything. And I said, it's $2,500. And he gave me $2,500, and I counted, tw and it was $2,500, and I put it in my pocket, and I wait for him, and I'm waiting for it, and he goes, all right, so what's included? <laughs> it's a different business what we do. He actually turned out to do very, very well, because he followed along. Um, it's amazing. Yeah, and I sold him what he needed. It was a 5 by 10 tent with 2,000 watts, a 5 by 5 tent with a thousand watt dimmable in it, magnetics for his flower, because you don't need to right. dim them in flower. And he got tents and he got CO2 and he got a light, you know, he got everything that he wanted to, you know, for that tent, for that stuff, new used. Um, but when he came back to set up six lights, it was a different conversation. So he had the experience and my suggestions were taken differently than somebody that just walks in. He had a list. You come in with a list, I know I'm in trouble. <laughs> right, because now you know what you wanted, you've done your research. So I know that you have an idea, or you're a sales rep. <clears throat> um, and so I know that you guys have an idea. That's kind of what I look for in a customer, um, is, you know, I can see their level. For new customers, it kind of takes like three trips. The first trip, you buy your stuff, you go home, you set it up. You come back with a whole bunch of new <laughs> questions, because the tent poles didn't go, what? And the instructions from China don't help. So you build a tent, you get everything set up, and now you start to use it, and now you have a different set of questions. So when you buy the equipment, you go home and you set it up, you come back with a new set of questions, right? And then you go home and you fix the rights and you right the wrongs, and now you have a new set of questions because now everything is growing well, you don't know what to do next. So generally I see you guys, you buy your equipment, I see you a whole bunch of times in a couple days, and then in two weeks, and then in two more weeks when it's time to flower. And then in two more months, when it's time to finish, and you've been following along, I know that if I see you in a month, that there's a problem, because I shouldn't see you until the end of flower. So if I see you in a month and you just bought your equipment, you're not here to tell me the two things. I hate trimming, and I should have flowered two weeks ago because my plants got too big. Probably I know you're, you're not here I for that. I hate bugs at that moment, yeah. and where is your pest? Yeah, or, or, or if you come in holding some equipment that I sold you. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, I'm going to have to deal with the return or something along those lines. Arme, but arme. you can see how important the relationship between these things. I don't have a favorite thing. I haven't picked a favorite or showed you guys a favorite or talked about. You know, here's, um, here's those brownie mats from GH. See, these things are awesome. And they got more than 50 in them. So for a couple bucks more, it's a great price. Those jiffy pellets add water and they swell up. I mean, everything in the store, I have good stories for. But just as easily, these things hold a lot of water for a long mm -hmm. time because they're bigger than these things. Mm -hmm. So if you water them with the same frequency, mm -hmm. oh man, I got the perfect schedule, three days. And so if you water them with the same frequency as something that dries faster, you run into that same overwater problem. But otherwise, if your plant is yellow, what does she need? Do you know? If you got a yellow plant, do you know? If you got a yellow plant, what does she need? Iron? That's the salts. Oh. Nitrogen. Probably overfed it. Right, more, yelling. more stuff. Add more stuff. Well, add some salts, but it's a flush. What? Epsom salts are a flush. Oh, I use flush for that. Yeah, Epsom salts are an incredibly <laughs> effective flush for plants. They pull the salt out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I did not know that. I would have assumed that if you run Epsom salt with PPM. Mm -hmm. yeah, Epsom salts are pH neutral and they do some kind of ion exchange. I've had a chemist explain it to me and I can't repeat what he said, but there's an ion mm -hmm. exchange in the root zone that it knocks out the salts and rebalances everything. Also, magnesium is like cellular currency. 
they'll exchange anything for it. So if one cell has iron, the other one has manganese, but they don't have anything the other one wants, so they won't trade. And so you get this buildup of nutrient in the plants where every cell is storing its own. You pour a bunch of magnesium in, all of a sudden the guy storing all the you know manganese or whatever it is he needs will release it all to the other cells. You'll have a whole bunch of stuff get released. And the plant will just corrects all kinds of deficiencies. I learned something coming from Epsom stores salts. too. Mag sulfur. He says Epsom salt, but Epsom salt's the salt that you buy in a bag. Mm -hmm. We sell it in any form of sweet. Yeah, and we, right. we, we, can, we have magnesium sulfate here. Right. We sell it in a, in a baggie like at the store. We have 50 pound offering listed bags for 26 bucks. There you go. <laughs> and when you use something like Epsom salt, anytime you take a powder, Epsom salt, any powdered nutrients, you dissolve it in some warm water, so you see it dissolve. You add more water to it. You can check the PPM with a digital meter because you can easily add too much of it as well because it's a salt that breaks down into its individual ions, Mg and S. That's what an ion is, is a salt that dissolves in water. That's why if you get a splash of water, it comes out of your hydro bucket. When the water evaporates, you're left with the nutrient. That was what get the salt recombines, just like putting too much into water. So here's a good ion exchange for mag. Um, I don't think it'll solve six weeks of too many nutrients when the plant's been miniaturized. But coming up on the end, it makes a nice flush. One of the ways that I show you guys to flush, um, this card. So it's the Future Harvest Continuous Grow Meter card. And this card here has a picture of a flush on the back. There's a specific product that's a salt magnet. It's Clearex by Botanicare. It's Final Clean by GH. And these things are ion exchangers, except they're ion magnets. They trap the ions and they pull it out of the media. In hydro, if you change the water, if you remove all the water, the only nutrients left are locked into the root hairs. There's nothing other than what the roots are holding. In media, the media holds the nutrients. So in hydro, a flush is a little less relevant. You kind of lower the PPM as you finish. So in here, what I show you guys to do is you got a five gallon pot. So you might mix up three gallons of flush. You'll test it. It might say 60 PPM. You'll pour it through the media and you'll catch it when it comes out of the bottom. Then you'll test it. It might say 700. You'll run it through again until you catch your gallon out of the bottom. It might say 900. You'll run it through a third time and it'll go up to 950. And you can see the numbers have stopped rising. So you're gonna get what you're gonna get out of it. So let's say it's 1,000 PPM comes out of the bottle, comes out of the media. If you've been feeding at 500, you gotta ask yourself if you should maybe be feeding a little less. If you've been feeding at, let's say it comes back 500 and you've been feeding at 1,000, now you know the plant's actually consuming 500 PPM. So you have an idea of what the plant is consuming. So if you keep feeding 1,000, 1,000, and 1,000, and I'm guilty of this, and you do a flush, and it sends your meter into overdrive, and you have to go to the store to buy one of the meters that goes up to 10,000, hmm? and your PPM comes out at 4,000. That was what my PPM did. Because I was feed, 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 feed. And suddenly you get there, not even suddenly. You know, all of a sudden I'm like, why is my plants three months old and they're still this big? Because my tap water, and if you- Never cleansed, that's what it sounds like. It's what? You never cleansed. Well, actually, sort of. If you look at this card, it gives you an idea about the water. In Vegas, my tap water is 550. I had no Shit. idea that Texas had 200 ppm water, 150 in some cases. Oh my God, my hotel water was delicious. <laughs> it was spectacular. Like I have a thing I do in my store where I get a shot glass, I put tap water in it, I grab one of my HM digital PBS meters, and I show people, look, 550. I pour it out. I get a bottle of water and I pour it in, I test it and it's 30. And I go, that's 520 ppm of poison mm -hmm. that you just removed. So while this graph here that has this little cutting in it is less relevant for Texas, it still gives you a pretty good idea. If you've got a cutting that wants 250 ppm and your water is at 500 and you add 250 more of nutrients, suddenly you're at three times what the plant wants. And if you continue to water at that dosage, it will continue to build up. So I have a miniaturized plant. It's literally, it's literally three months old. It's still this big. And 
you know, you watch and they, you know, they grow like, you know, they grow like stink. I mean, they just, you can't stop them from growing. So I'm like, what the fuck? You know, so you have to move the light out of the way because my light's 18 inches off the plant. And so I water a little, maybe more water is the solution. And then I buy a hydroponic store and suddenly, like I see everybody else run into the same problem. This, too much light, I mean too much PPM, too much water, too many nutrients. And so I kind of go through all of these things with you because too much light, too much water, too many nutrients. And then if things go well and you're not getting the yield that you're supposed to, not enough plant. And so these are kinds of the things that I go through with you guys to help explain. And again, all the bulbs work, it's the grower interpretation. All the nutrients work, it's the grower interpretation. All the lights work, all the hoods work, all of these things work. Some people just can't drive as well as others, hmm. but it's grower interpretation in all cases. And so that's kind of what I put together to show you, you know, we got, you know, you got hydro, meet, um, hydro cloners, light movers. These are the kinds of equipment, like it used to be lights. Now you got a light mover. You used to have to have your girlfriend do your trimming. You know, she'd be good for 10 hours, one day. Anything more than that, forget it. She's not gonna do it. And then you end up with something like Green Bros who can do 20 people worth a day. One person to stand there and just kind of, you know, take it in and out and move the flowers around. Digital meters that can give you an idea. Phototron, I don't know if you guys remember Phototron. You would take a soil sample and send it to them. Dude, if the plant's yellow, give it some nitrogen. If they're all purple, well, it's a space this big by all purple, the one measly little plant in the middle. Um, not the ones in the ads. The one in the ads were spilling out of the sides. It was amazing. But in real life, they wanted you to send stuff in to tell you, look, the plant's yellow. That's why girls grow better. They don't do stuff like that. They don't do guy stuff. They don't put light right on top of the plant. They don't water a little bit every day. They're not in there hanging out with it. So what can I do? In the last five minutes, I picked all the leaves off. Now what can I do? <laughs> and so these are the things that people get in trouble. They get in their own way. Leaves convert light into energy. Can you take off all the leaves? Yes. Does that slow things down? Only if you believe that, only if you believe that leaves convert sugar, light into sugar. Only if you believe that nutrients aren't the thing, they're only relative to how much light you have. Plants still grow. I mean, you can still take the leaves off. Sugar leaves will do it. The plants still photosynthesize. But again, generally, leaves are the kinds of things that you would pull one off if it got in the way of a flower or something like that. If you have lots and lots of leaves and one or two at the bottom are dying, perfect, yank them. That's how you. Uh, that's how you get it done. But just yanking off the leaves arbitrarily is, is like, I, I, it's never the answer. Hmm. Leaves convert light into sugar. All right. Do you guys have any questions? I mean, it was a lot, and it's a way to think about it that you guys haven't thought about it before. Um, so with the magnesium thing, uh, and this may be a very you know. Uh, novice question, but can you overdo it with magnesium? It's salt. Yes. Okay. If your plant wants 500 and you keep feeding it a thousand, yes, it will build up just the same way. Sure. It'll sit and it'll build up. Right. As the water evaporates, leaves the salt behind. Right. So if your bucket dries out, any place that didn't have roots, the salts get left behind. That's why the flush stuff is not a salt. It's it grabs the salt and it pulls it out. It has an, a higher affinity for salt. Hmm than the media. So it captures it and pulls it through. Otherwise, it wouldn't come out. Mm -hmm. So if you just evaporate the salt, the dissolved solids, that's what you measure with the total dissolved solids meter, stays behind. So if you only fed with mag sulfur, and mag sulfur, and mag sulfur, think about if you just took the jar and poured it in a container mm -hmm. and let the water evaporate. You'd be left with a 50 pound bag of OMRI certified Epsom salt. Right. That's what would come out of it. What's in the bottle is consistent. Um, when you buy a big bag of magnesium salt, you better have a big res, because if you've got 50 gallons, it's hard to get a low number with powders. Powders are 10 times the strength of liquids. If you continue to add Epsom salt to your liquid and you continue to stir, eventually you couldn't dissolve anymore. Mm -hmm. Saturation. You could heat it up, molecules would move further apart, but when it cooled down, it precipitate back out. That's what happens when you put too much salt in is it stays in there when the water evaporates. So yes, you could use. It's a hard thing to do. 
you'd have to literally like just like too many nutrients sure. if you put a thousand ppm of nutrients and a thousand ppm of epsom salt you know even if the plants want 500 and you're giving them a thousand of epsom salt yes you could but it is very hard to do yep and so if you don't have any questions um this is kind of what i got for you guys today just to keep it in perspective of um what is and what is not important and so you know what the pitfalls and statistical probabilities are i know if i see you three weeks after you bought the light you've overwatered and you have uh, bugs you have black gnats in your media i know that if you come in and you tell me that you've got 200 watts worth of light and you're in hydro i know that you can't make it to the end um, lights are a big deal if you've got a 12-week cycle and you've got 200 watts worth of light Jeez, 20, what, you got 18 watts a week, 15 watts a week worth of light? That's your allowance, 12-week cycle, start to finish, 200 watts. So you see people grow with compact fluorescence or stuff like this. It's a simple thing, do the math. A compact fluorescent, 100-watt light, something like that, you know, they put a dozen of them in a box, you know, the box looks you know, something like this, and they line the edge of the inside of the aluminum foil, and they try to make these little containers with compact fluorescence. But... Unless you're in an area five by five, two feet deep, you're never gonna get 24 flowers you know, per thousand watts. And if you've got 400 watts of compact fluorescent, that's really 100 watts worth of electricity, you're really gonna end up with nothing. You know, it's a very, it's a very long, slow, painful grow with super low lights like that. But you catch the videos, you know, people do them. Um, you know, something that takes 90 or 100 days, um, that's a lot of work and energy for, you know, the yield that you get from no light. If a 400 is going to give you eight flowers, what's a 100 compact fluorescent going to give you? Uh, just like you see in the pictures. Um, you know, some guys are like, oh, look at the flowers I got, and they'll hold it up their hand to compare. And then there are those guys who take off the branch and hold it next to their arm to compare. Does a compact fluorescent get you there? It can, but you put little flowers in your hand and you go, look what I grew versus those guys who are like, you know, holding things like this, um, you know, this big for their flowers and they got a stick and it looks like they could hit you with it. There's a big <laughs> deal difference. But again, the compact fluorescence, if you're growing, you know, if you're in your mom's house, you know, that's probably all you want for a closet, um, you know, because that's what's going to work for you. But anything like beyond that, you can quickly see how 100 watts of light divided by 12 weeks, 200 watts of light divided by 12 weeks is about nothing. It's not the thing that you're going to brag about. And, oh my God, look what I got. It's a lot of work for very little results. But there are certain places where that works. So that's good too. But lights based on yield. You have to have a question. I mean, you got notes, something. Yeah. Um, four, eight foot, T12, three foot, T20, T12 pictures, and a room and a four by eight by eight frame. How many bulbs? Eight bulbs. Okay, how long are they? Okay, and how many lumens is each bulb? I don't know. It's a T12, it's the Walmart, it's a shop light, right? Yeah. Okay, the T5 bulb, the brightest of them, are 2,000 lumens for two feet. Mm -hmm. The four foots are 54 watts. Yeah. So how many watts is each bulb? Each, watt, each bulb is uh, 80 watts. 80 watts. So 160 watts per picture times four is 640 watts. Okay, so 640 watts. Now let's talk about how light is made because that's a big deal difference. Um, growth, one half of our grow tube. What's a grow tube? Um, like, one's half of our cool whites and half of our... Oh, different spectrum. All right, let's even, even before we get there, let's talk about, um, you've got how, how light's made. Compact fluorescence. The excited gas, electron shells, these things orbit, the electron moves up in orbit, drops back down, emits a photon. That does not produce nearly as much light as an HID bulb, like on this wall. HID bulbs, however, have gas that they heat with an arc. It does not excite the electrons in the outer shell, but they emit an enormous amount of <laughs> photons when compared to um, fluorescence, an enormous amount of photons, but they emit an even more enormous amount of heat. That's why something like an LED, like Nextlight, you can get five by thousand watts results in a four by four space because you can get that penetration. So we're talking about penetration, space, how much light they put out. You have 80 watt tubes, but those things don't put out as much light as a T5, 
which does not put out as much light as an HID, which puts out more light than an LED, but it does not produce as much heat. LEDs directly convert electricity into photons. That's what they do. They don't have to heat a gas. They don't excite orbital shells. They emit photons. But they still produce heat. All lights heat. Wavelengths are heat. Ultraviolet, infrared. That's why your car is 140 when it's 100 degrees outside. So you have 80 watts of the most efficient light related to heat, not output. So you might have 640 light watts that you're consuming, but in terms of compared to other things, you have literally like 350 watts worth of T5. You have 400 watt, I mean 200 watts worth of an HID bowl. So you have the same 80 watts is spread out over eight feet. And if you took all of those bulbs and you squished them into one 600 watt bulb, you'd probably run at far more efficiency than you would with those. You don't get the penetration. So what you do is you would grow a big mother with like a 600 watt light. And you would take like 400 cuttings from her. And you'd put them in one of these root riot trays and you'd grow them. And as soon as they started to root, you'd flower them. And you would literally just cutting, 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 cutting. Next bulb in the space between. Cutting, 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 cutting. Because your light's going to get you this much penetration. So if you flower a cutting this big and it doubles, that's all you get. You don't get more mm. penetration than that because there's so little light, the first two leaves are going to shield everything else. You're not going to get any penetration. There's no side lighting. There's nothing. You've got 80 watts spread out over 8 feet versus 54 watts spread out over 4 feet. And a different way of producing the light. So sometimes I have to tell you guys, it may not be the hobby for you. Because you can't get there from here. That's the only reason I say that. You may not want to do. Because the results are not necessarily worth it. Um, you think, oh, I'm going to get away with it with this less light, but the final result, um, while quality may not have production value. And so if you grow for yourself, that's great. But by the time you've got either eight foot tubes, how many eight foot tubes did you have? Eight. Okay, so about this big, about this uh, wide? Uh, four by eight. They were eight foot long, so four foot wide, yeah. eight feet long. Yeah. So literally like from me to you. Yes. Right. And so, <laughs> have his own room. right. And then we talk, you know, you look at that space and now you get a 600 watt light for the same electricity in a third the space with six times the yield. Yeah. yeah. And so there's that trade off there. That's why you buy the 91 octane. You're already there. Forget yeah, 87. <laughs> you buy octane because octane's what lights the fuel. Octane's the ump behind the power. So when I ask you yield and you tell me something by it per plant, then I got to go, okay, oh, we how many plants? That out of you. And then I got to go, okay, how much light? Because if I put you in a car and gave you 10 gallons of gas and told you to drive to Cali, uh -uh. maybe, maybe if you got 100 miles a gallon, you know, you'd have to know mileage on the car. You'd have to know how far the distance is. All of these things are relative to final output, expected results, what the final value is. And so it's not that I say that it doesn't work. I say that um, it's not worth it. That's what I say. It works. It all finishes. 30 years ago. 30 years ago, they were still using 1,000 watt street lights. Oh, the, yeah, the, the, the gardeners, the we guys who were doing to, production go to level a warehouse gardening. and swipe them out of an old warehouse, but you never got there. Yeah, the guys who do. Yeah, why does it have to involve swiping them out of an old warehouse? Well, nobody can really sell them to you without a lot of that's, money. And plus, you know, we're already breaking the law. Big. No, we weren't breaking the law. <laughs> so, yeah, so, yeah, you can't steal. We were counterculture. So yeah. Like, we were just realigning resources of the military industrial conflict. redistribution of the government right, yeah. I completely you know, understand. I, I had that experience with the uh, I started off um, uh, using fluorescence because of cost and I you know you thought it was going to matter it, it, it. It, did, it did work it did work yeah. but when I made that switch oh yeah oh wow I, it was literally uh, yeah yeah it was not it the was same game we're doing the same thing but it not ending you know we don't get the same results different game it, it really is it really is when you step up and so they had the 1,000 watts back then. They may not have had as many hood shapes. Mm. They had CO2 back then. They didn't have the kind of quality burners that we have today. They didn't have LEDs back then. LEDs are awesome. 
Okay. You know, they, when you say burners, are you referring to CO2 high? burners? Oh, so. CO2 burners. They had them back then. They had CO2 burners. You know, um, open air CO2 burners. Um, they had them like they do today. They weren't water cooled back then. But the guys who grew knew CO2, light. Um, light movers came on the scene, move the light. But these guys who grow, they grow very big plants, very few, very big plants in very big buckets that you only have to water once every 10 days because it would take you five days to get to the other end of watering and then you got to trim everything and you got to shape it up then you got to come back and water again. So very few very big plants are always easier to maintain than tables and tables. One guy can maintain 15 lights in media. One guy maintains 12 lights in hydro. So 24 hmm. lights and you need two people in hydro and one and a half people in soil. Hmm. So does sunlight work better than, than artificial light? Any artificial light? Okay, um, now we're talking relative, right? So sunlight's awesome. It's tough to have too much light with sunlight. Yeah. Hey. Sunlight, you know, 96 million miles. It goes 100 feet underwater. You know, average water, you know, 200 feet, you know, kind of max underwater. Stuff grows and photosynthesizes underwater. It's spectacular. Inside, not better nor worse. Inside, different game. Yeah. Gives you the ability to control where it all goes. Yes. You play God. Yeah. It gives you the ability to spend lots of money on things like tents and environment and controllers and all these other things. If you were outside, look at farmers. They buy 10, 10, 10. They throw it on their shit, right? <laughs> when the plant's growing, it takes the end. So by the time it's done growing, you're at 599. And now they start flowering. And by the time they're done flowering, you're at 211. She knew what she wanted when she wanted it. You didn't have to deal with it. Time release. They throw it out there. They're not looking at each plant, <laughs> judging each one. It's 40,000 acres going on in this shit. They just drop the seeds and go. They don't look back. They leave it alone. There's water. nothing to be done. Yeah, water. they water. There's an irrigate even, water. and it's tap water, you know, even Shitty worse. Water. Yeah, it's gray <laughs> water, and yet it works so well, and everything outside works so well because you're not overwatering, you're not overfeeding, well, and you're you not can. giving it too much light. You can. Well, it's not tough. too much light, but too yeah. much water and you too could, much nutrient, you can. You could. But it's harder. Yeah, and this is a long process. You know, it takes forever for corn to grow. I mean, I'm from, you know, Las Vegas, you know, for all I know. So I know for all I know, it could take a year and a half. I mean, I've never grown a stick corn in my life. <laughs> and so, I mean, I went, I was making sushi one night. And I'm standing there and I'm trying to work out why I've never seen a, a cucumber that looks like this. Until the lady comes over and goes, it's a zucchini. Ah. <laughs> what a, thank you. Ha <laughs> ha, the answer is a keen egg. Okay, right, now I know. I was wondering why they were so small and dried out and, you know? And so, yeah. You really can't tell the difference between a good outdoor and a good indoor grow. I could line up 10 flowers and you'd be lucky to guess half right. I've done the test in my f store where I've literally lined up three flowers and asked Big Mouth to tell me the difference. <laughs> I took two flowers from the same branch and I put them of the three. And he goes, soil, hydro, hydro. And he was right on two of them. But unfortunately, one of them, he guessed both, so I'm not sure if that counts. But you'd be lucky to be able to 50%, and you're guessing at that point, soil, hydro, if it's all good. If it's done right, you can't tell the difference. You might get more in a shorter time. Um, soil might be a higher quality, but you can definitely get that quality from hydro or something close enough that you can't tell. And so those kinds of things are speed-based, production-based, the amount of effort you want to put into it, how much light you have in veg. These are now cost factors that go into it. Not, it's not an artisan thing. It's not a private thing anymore. It's much bigger. You're pretty funny. You've got to have one question. We've got something. You've answered any of my other questions that I've had. I mean, I've, I'm pretty much set straight. I, I, I'm just looking for more toys. But with what <laughs> I got, I, I can't. I can't go any bigger, I can't go any, well, I can go, always go smaller, but I can't, with the area of space that I have, I'm stuck. Until Are you, you getting get the yields? Are you getting the yields that I say you're getting 24 flowers per thousand? One and a half per thousand? I'm, I'm going bigger, so I'm taking up less space with, I'm doing more with less, so it takes up. Yes, but the yield is based on light, not oh, light I'm, I'm, So are you in I'm, the zone of 24 I'm flowers or more? 
I'm Perfect. very happy. Yes, you have to be in that last range because there's a difference between 16 flowers and 24 flowers and the last eight flowers are your profit. And so it's easy to uh, quickly get out of the profit zone oh, yeah. and just kind of, you know, limp along without the yields that you're supposed to get. It's a pretty quick way to get there. I have a question. You mentioned something about magnetics earlier. What, what, what were you referring to there? Just about magnetics for... Magnetic ballast. This is that old school heavy ballast. See all these? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, this yeah, is yeah. a magnetic okay. ballast. Yeah. In yeah. flower, you don't really need to dim. If you don't have enough plant to put into flower, when you start flowering, you're out of the money. <laughs> and so if your flower lights are going to be at 1,000 watts all the time, you can come to a hydroponic store and buy their magnetics. You can buy their used magnetics. If you can get a deal on magnetics cheaper than digitals, buy a magnetic. Magnetics are just fine. They convert light into electricity just like digitals do, if you don't need the dimming feature. And the thing about digitals, they're awesome. They don't necessarily last as long. Hmm? I'll buy a 20-year-old magnetic fearlessly because if it's 20-year-old and still working, it's like an old Datsun Toyota kind. It's going to go forever. And so I'll buy something like that. And the way they used to make shit in the old days ain't like the way they make shit now. Oh. And so you got a magnetic, you know it's going to last. And so no fear of buying magnetics. And if you don't have to ever dim them, Why you can buy three that? magnetics for the price sometimes of like one digital. So Two and a half magnetics for the price of one digital. Is that the main advantage of digital, just being able to dim it? Um, digital, all, the ballast also runs cooler because it does not have windings or any type of conversion into heat. However, people tell me that their ballasts run hot. Yeah, but the reality is the glass in the hood is far hotter than the ballast. And the hood is, you know, some of these hoods, like you look at this triple XL reflector, that thing's like five, six, seven feet of radiant sheet metal. Mm -hmm. You get a regular hood, like, like, you know, one of the eight inch, just regular size hoods, you take a digital thermometer to it, that thing's 150 degrees. It's four square feet of 150 degree radiant sheet metal. So I did an experiment. I put a little fart snatcher fan, I put some ducting to one side of the hood, it has the glass on it, 151 degrees. My ducting is 99 degrees on its way out. I put an insulator over the hood and waited an hour. When I came back and measured my hood, it was 102 degrees. The hood, five square feet of radiant sheet metal was 49 degrees cooler and the ducting on its way out was 114 degrees. It was like 15 degrees hotter in the ducting on the way out. So all that heat out, take out the glass and you get even more heat out because the glass converts light to heat. That's why your car is so much hotter on the inside on a hot day than the outside on a sunny day because the glass converts light to heat. Infrared, ultraviolet, wavelengths we can't see. Glass absorbs all that and converts it to heat. That's why they make glass in big buildings two layers and green. Touch the glass in your car when you go outside. Always hotter than outside as if it's been in the sun. Why do you think you put a solar shade up? Because it's hot, all lights heat. They produce light in different ways and different amounts of heat. But for the most part, lights heat. And the more IR and UV you get, um, the more heat you transmit as well. So in the summertime, the sun's higher in the sky, you get more blue light, it also has a shorter trip through the atmosphere. So more of it hits the ground. That's why four o'clock, the ground's hotter than it was at noon. It's been absorbing all the IR and UV coming down for the last four hours. It's a big deal. Um, you know, so you, those are like that kind, those are the kinds of things. Gotcha. But magnetics, you're gonna put the ballast outside the garden. And if you put it inside the garden and you've got a dozen, you've got an air conditioner. So it's irrelevant how many, how, how much heat it puts out. The glass you take out and stop venting and it'll be cooler any other, any way possible um, by doing it like that. The glass is a huge thermal conductor. Yeah, I never thought about moving the glass. That's a really, and it doesn't affect the bulb in any way, huh? Well, no, you get three to 5% more light, actually. Sure. Sure, because sure. your glass isn't converting sure. light to heat. That's a big deal difference. Wow. Um, the other thing I suggest is stop venting. If you take all the hoods, if you take all the glass out of the hoods, there's really, there's no point in insulating a hood at that point. But if you don't duct, add CO2. You can buy, you can buy a literally 10 amp, 1000 watt air conditioner that'll do 6000 watts in a burner. So if you have 6000 watts in flour, you can get one amp, 10 amp, 1000 watt AC that will cool all of them in a burner. If you can add CO2, that's 25% more. If you have 6000 watts, 
25 percent more is 1500 watts your ac is going to be a thousand watts no matter what so you get thousand watts so you now you have seven thousand watts total for the flower plus 15 you get plus 15 more so it equivalents out to about 5500 watts for significantly more yield because co2 is 25 percent with no electricity and no heat and if anything, you can run your plants a little warmer because you want them to sweat because they're, if they're growing faster, the sweat's the metabolic process. You want them to off-gas and you want them to sweat more because that's how they rid themselves of their waste. So those are what you're shooting for. But as soon as you turn on a light, stop venting, buy an AC, get yourself CO2. CO2 is 25% more. Always. Light for energy, water CO2 equals sugar and oxygen. Nowhere in the equation do nutrients exist. They are relative, but nowhere in the nutrient Photosynthesis, light for energy, sugar, I mean water and CO2 equals sugar and oxygen. Oh, no. that's, that's the magic of this conversion equation. Nothing to do with CO, nothing to do with nutrients. They just balance the salt inside and out of the plant. The, but, the heat's the hard part, yeah. The what? The dealing with the heat's the hard part. Yeah, light's heat. And it, it, I was just, I tell everybody, if you just buy the AC, you buy a good AC, you can get a one ton on wheels for $2,500, it will do 6,000 watts and a burner. It will be on all the time, but it can handle 6,000 watts on a burner, those one ton on wheels. It's got like the 10 inch exhaust, the big square in, and that pulls air from outside and then takes the heat out of the room and blows that air outside. Then the AC takes the room air in with the CO2 and all the odors, cools it down and blows it back into the room. The best thing you could do when you have 6,000 watts is literally or more is you just buy an air conditioner because that's really where you start to see the benefit mathematically from co2 and buying an air conditioner everybody fights the heat it's the hvac guys that always knock it out of the park they put in an air conditioner and even my hvac guys will tell you as they've gotten bigger and their gardens have grown if you put in too much ac so it operates at 75 percent the moment he turned on the fans and started aggressively blowing the plants. Not so the leaves turned over, not so you blow them trying to strengthen them. Fuck that, add silica, it's not even worth it. Just clearing out the gas that's in between the leaves because that forces the stomas to produce uh, offshoot less gas, to release less gas because as the concentration increases, the stoma effectiveness changes. So as he blows them and as the whole room becomes more even and as he raised the lights to the right height, that suddenly the garden changed again when he had more than enough air to cover the room and to run it at 75% and to add fans. Um, the atmosphere, and which is really what we're talking about, um, if you don't run the air conditioner, if you have too big of an air conditioner, it's on for five minutes, you'll get too much humidity. And so you want the air conditioner to be on most of the time because it drains the water out of the air and plants. And the more they sweat, every drop they sweat, is one more drop up the root because if they sweat one and don't suck one up where are we headed we're right. headed to dehydration and the plant dying so just like uh putting a paper towel in water capillary action wicks it right up man that whole paper towel will get wet you just put the corner in there leaf drops one drop of water roof takes i mean root takes up one drop of water two leaves drop roots have to take them up the more the plant sweats the more roots you have to have the roots are the lungs of the plant and so the heat's a real thing um, ACs, it is, you know, it's a, it's a tough thing to bite. You've just spent $4,000 on lights, $6,000 on lights, and you're going to spend just about that much on only the AC. It's a tough thing to do, especially for a new grower. The battles that it saves you, the efficiency that it works, the big ACs, um, four times the air, twice the air, four times the cooling. Good day. That kind of stuff it just absolutely changes the way a garden looks and feels and works. Yes, so I'm always a fan. Um, in fact, I will put the show box you. in the middle. You can see that that box is like an air pig. It's like a plenum that you'd have in your car. It pulls a little bit of air out from all the hoods. In this situation, would you keep the glass in the hood? No. no. Why would you? Because all it's going to do is suck in where the glass was instead. Suddenly, you've got four hoods times minus four glasses. Glass is the second hottest thing in the garden. I suggest in something like this, a very small four inch fan. You need to move very little air to extract the bulk of the heat. Very little air is required 
to extract the bulk of the heat. And in something like this, you would use insulators because you are venting. If you're not venting, you wouldn't use insulators because it wouldn't matter. The heat would just stay in the room. But in this case, if you covered the hoods with insulators, um, dragged the smallest amount of air out of the room, you'd cut down on humidity, you'd take the hottest air from the garden, and it would be the most effective way to do it, and you could still have CO2 burner, like a little four-inch fan. Turn down to a three-inch fan with a speed controller. That's realistically all you would need to pull as much heat as you would want to pull out and as much air out of the garden. And what I ask you guys to think about is this. A six-inch fan, what is it, like 400 cubic feet per minute, something like that? If you have a 10 by 10 room, eight feet high, that's 800 cubic feet. 10 times 10 is 100 times 8, 800 cubic feet. If you've got a 400 CFM fan, it empties that room every two minutes. If you have an air conditioner in there, forget about it. More importantly, if you don't have an air conditioner in there or anything, and you're just venting 400 cubic feet a minute or a room every five minutes, let's say, in a four bedroom house with a living room, dining room, you would empty the whole house every half hour, every 20 minutes. You would suck all the air out of your house every 20 minutes. But here's the thing, moving more air doesn't cool the lights any better. There's only so much you're gonna get by running air across the lights. You can run colder air, but you might as well not vent and cool the room with that kind of electricity. You don't vent cold air. So people ask me, should I vent cold air through the lights? Will that help? No, just keep it in the room. Just keep cooling the air over and over and over, and it'll drive the temperature down, and it won't have to work as hard as, as it catches up and it balances out all the lights in the room. And so ACs are always, always the money tip once you start getting a bunch of lights because now you can add a light mover. I mean, now you can add CO2, which is 25% more. And you're fighting less heat because you took the glass out. And it's just overall, adding an AC to a big garden lets you put a CO2 burner in. And now you can go get liquid propane. Those tanks last a while. They're fucking hot, man. Even with the water exchange, the heat exchange water ones, um, man, that water comes out boiling, it's so hot. That's a lot of heat you take out of the room. But you know, you break that lid off a bit, crank it up all the way, and you have one of those 12 inch flames. <laughs> you know, I remember doing that. So you got one of those flames, your lighter only lasts five seconds, but it produces an enormous amount of heat times eight burners or four burners. You know, whatever it is that you're running is an enormous amount of heat, especially it's on and off all day. But CO2 is 25%. So the AC is always the ticket for cooling your room, especially with lots of light although it seems like an expensive thing up front. But I'm, a, I'm always a fan of AC, 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 AC. Just buy a real AC. If you're gonna go there, buy a real AC for the money. There's no way around it. So much more yield and weight. Um, what else? That was pretty much it. I don't usually get more questions than beyond this because <laughs> it's kind of the same thing. Do you have a question? You sat so quietly. Oh, um, okay, so apparently you what, kind of represent all these manufacturers? Yeah. So these are the things that we actually use. There's a lot more manufacturers that I don't represent because these are the products that are most familiar. These are the staples in our industry. Turbo Clone, Clone X, um, Great White. These are the staples. That's my RO machine. It's not a staple of the industry yet, but it's cheaper than all the other ROs that the other manufacturers sell. and. I can literally, in the video I made, I show you my RO system is one-to-one -one waste. There was one RO that I bought from one of the manufacturers, one of the distributors. It was their in-house brand. You compare it to their, here's their clean water, and their wastewater was a 10-foot arc. You couldn't believe, and that was on the low setting, on how much wastewater the other ones produced. So I made it like a 15-minute video where we, I bought the competitors, I covered up the labels, wrote my competitor, my competitor two on them, and then I looked at these things, and they just don't, they're not relative to what we do. What we do is we go through a lot of water. It doesn't change the PPMs the way my machine works, it's cheaper, and so I go through them, but these are the kinds of RO machines, I only sell to stores, but these are the kinds of tips and tricks, things change, people get better at them. Light rail, once you turn on a light, if you're not moving it, you're losing 25%. Mondi domes. Um, then we have some new meters, like this one from Future Harvest. This is a Grow Boss meter. It's a, con a continuous meter. You put this in the water, you hang this on the wall, and it lets you know. 
Here's a new meter from HM Digital, the Hydromaster. It's got a battery in it, so when you unplug it, you can walk it around and use it like a handheld meter. It's got like one of these. So it's got the accuracy of the big size professional. It's got like smartphone menu button, um, programmable calibration, up and down, PPM, pH, all the different factors. You can set it and work with it. Um, you know, here's two great meters, but you gotta use them. And you gotta know why you're using them. Otherwise you just buy them and they sit and then you end up killing your plant with too much salt. Mm -hmm. So I go through these meters and I put them in people's hands so they can see them. So the store owners can see them. So you guys can see what a turbo clone machine looks like and how awesome the Green Bros trimmer is. How much and is that bad boy? That's a bad boy price. <laughs> I think that, I'm yeah, curious, a little about four. Huh? A little about 4,000. Okay. But it I've been to a bunch of shows, people. so that's why I'm. I've, I've seen different quotes and I've heard different quotes, and people throw out different quotes because they're at a show and they're trying to get their their waste off before before they retail have to go to the wholesale. Next. Yes, exactly. And that's I don't why want to I'm carry it curious. to the next one, so I'll always sell it cheaper. Thank you, damn right. I want deliver to the next store. <laughs> I know but something like this. You know, people. You know, I had one of the stores. People were just like, "Oh, oh mm -hmm. my God, that is so much." And then I go to other stores, and they're like. That's not even enough. We've got that gas one that you fire up and you shovel it in. And it trims it and shoots it out the other end and distributes it to their locations for you. It's so good. And then those things are ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars mm dollars -hmm. But then look at how many people it takes to pick all the crops in a field. I mean, you have to have that apple day where everyone goes and gets a basket and you charge them <laughs> by the apples and get them all out of your field. It's an enormous, enormous amount of work. And then what we're talking about is presentation. Mm. So you got to make sure it looks right. Presentation is a big deal. Everything. And you have to think about it like East Coast doesn't want the same presentation as West Coast. East Coast likes little leaf. What's on the leaf is just fine. There's no problem. But East Coast, I want to see how you grew it. And you can tell everything you need to know about a plant by the leaf and the flower. If you pull, it, pull the individual flowers apart, you see the stalk, you see the stem, you see the bottom of the leaf, you can see spider mites, webs, you can see, right, you can see little uh, white fly eggs, you can tell all of it. So people on the East Coast want a little trim, want a little East Coast trim, they want to see a little leaf. People on the West Coast, oh man, they want that down to a bikini just as little as possible, <laughs> just with flower and nothing else, man. And you know, there really is a difference, but the East Coast ball busters aren't California surfers. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, right, it works. This is pretty good. I mean, this gets you as close to a California trim with just leaving a little bit. You don't double up the flowers in there. It's supposed to be a dry trim. It's easy to wait until they're too dry. So it's mostly dry. So when I tell you guys about curing, the things to think about are like the water is in two places inside the plant. There's extracellular water and intracellular water. So you harvest your plants, you chop them down. It dries pretty quick. That's the extracellular water. That's the water that evaporates quickly, the stuff inside the cells. Now you take the flowers and you put them in a jar and you seal them up and you burp them a little bit. Suddenly what was inside the cell meanders out and now the flower gets wet again. So now you put it back on the drying rack or right, or you keep having to put it back on the jar. So those are kinds of the ways that you end up drying them. Generally, after you get the extracellular water out and the intracellular moves out and you get a little bit of dry on that, that's perfect for a trimmer like this. It's not all the way dry. We're beating it up, turns it to dust as it tumbles around. Hmm. Just that little bit of wet. Also keeps sticky from sticking so much on the thing. It kind of stays more on the plant. And if you don't put two layers of flowers, it doesn't push down and beat it down and pinch it between them. And the thing works spectacularly well. And it's got like a nice little catch tray underneath. Is it easy to clean and take apart? Um, it is easy to take apart. Is anything easy to clean? Uh, I'm not a good cleaner. <laughs> but the, the blades come right apart, yeah. like literally one screw, they both come off, a little oh, thing shit. comes off, and you have two blades, and you pull apart, you grab a rag, because yeah. you can't put your fingers in there because they're blades, so mm. cut your fingers and get those little slices. And you clean them from the inside out, and then you wipe the edges around the edges, and it does a pretty good job. You can soak them so it softens up. You can warm it up. That makes it easier, too. And so you can warm it up. Um, yeah, stainless steel. Um, it runs and runs and runs. It runs a long time before you got to clean it. And it produces a lot of, it replaces a lot of people. Mm -hmm. One person just literally sits there and feeds it and you wait the minute and you tumble them out and then you lift the lid and you fill it up again, you tumble it out. It's, uh, 
It's a, it's a lot of work just saying it adds one person, and that takes the place of like 10 people. Yeah, and, but a good six pack of beer will go on ahead and sit your friend down for a long time too. Just saying. Yeah, yeah, like I usually say, your girl's good for the first 10 hours. Hmm. And then you're on your own because she's out. Or you just leave her alone and call your buddies up. Yeah, you know, I make that joke in my book. After about 15 minutes, it's not the awesome thing you thought it was. It's not. It's not, right. <laughs> when you get invited to a trim party, it's your yeah, job to stay for the whole thing. Everybody's always excited until oh, it yeah. starts. Oh, yeah. you do there. They have two slices <laughs> of pizza. And they trim for 15 minutes. They stay for 30, but you can already tell they're on their way out. Right. Oh, yeah, dude. Somebody just called. <laughs> and those are the real problems of growing. Not the killing the plant shit. That's the easy stuff. The real problems are dealing with, yeah, finding people to show up to trim. Green Bros Trim Pro does the work of a team. No, the success is like, it can be, I mean, that's, that's a lot of work if you're successful. Yes. Huh.